to all the proclaimers of the word. Amen. Amen. To my pastor, Bishop Carl E. Holly, Sr., in his absence. So we're going to call on our president for the purpose of the service, our Reverend Dondi Holt. Praise the Lord, saints. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, saints. Praise the Lord. Amen. We do give honor to God, to the Spirit of Christ, to the pastor of this church. Amen. Reverend Fred Crawford. Amen. To all you God's people. I see Pastor Wingate. God bless you. Good to have you. Amen. Thank God for President Susie Gilbert. Amen. Of the Women's Auxiliary and all Amen. you who've assembled. Amen. We do honor the Lord, and I'm just overwhelmed and just, just Jesus happy. Amen. Right now, uh, this vision actually started a few years ago when uh, the pastor of this church, uh, Frederick Crawford, said, "Listen, we need to get some associate ministers in here to preach." Amen. Then I got a young man named Earl Taylor who came aboard and said, "Well, what can I do?" And I said, "Well, we want to put together because we have in the associate ministers of Umba, we have what I call an embarrassment of riches." We have some talented, anointed young men and women of God who can preach and will preach if you give them the opportunity to preach. Amen? Amen. amen. So we give them this opportunity and amen. And for some of you, it's an audition. Because often my pastor will say, well, who do you know who's good? And so I want to be able to say, well, I heard so-and-so and they're good. Amen. Amen. We already have some of them coming to memorial, but we look forward to even more. So let's just worship the Lord together today. Amen. And give God the glory, the honor, and the praise. God bless you. Amen. We want to just move right along with the service. Amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. for God is truly good. Amen. Amen. First, give an honor to God, who is the captain of my ship and the lily of my valley. Amen. And the ink of my very soul. Yes, yes. And we'd like to also acknowledge the pastor and the shepherd of this house in and, and the uh, name of Reverend Crawford in his absence and to all of the members and all of the officers. But then we'd also like to give uh, um, an acknowledgement to the United Missionary Baptist Association where our moderator is, uh, Carl Washington, and where our first Vice moderator is my very own pastor, Reverend right. Dr. Anthony Lowe, amen. amen. And to Renee, uh, Reverend Renee Washington, God, amen. 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 So my scripture for today is going to come from a very uh, well-known section of the Bible called Psalm number 23. And many of you know this psalm by road memory, amen. And our subject matter for today is the Lord is my shepherd. All right. Amen. Amen, somebody. See, I want you to know that I could easily stand here on this day. I understand that the, the topical uh, subject here today is I am a survivor. I understand that the thematic thrust is I am a survivor. Right. And I could easily stand here and talk for I am a survivor. Right. And I am a survivor not because of my will, but because the Lord is my shepherd. Amen, somebody. Family, me being a survivor has nothing to do with what I have done, but it has everything to do with the leadership and the hand of God on my life. But I want you to know that in Psalm 23, we got a man named David that said, the Lord is my shepherd. David is crooked as he was. David is adulterous as he was. David as sexual as he was. David as ruddy as he was. David as murdersome as he was. David as strong as he was. David as fierce as he was. He recognized that it was Yahweh and not his way. He understood that Yahweh was the God of Israel. See, God knew all about David before David knew who God was. And I want you to know that once David got a whiff of who God was, he understood that Yahweh gives Provision. I got three points for you now. Yahweh gives provision. Amen, somebody. Yahweh gives protection. I want you to understand protection right now. And Yahweh keeps his promise. Come on, somebody. The Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not want. For he maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He calms me down. He makes me When I want to turn up and when I want to turn out, he makes me chill out, he dries my tears, he quenches my thirst, and he eases my hurt. Oh, yes. Won't you help me magnify the Lord today? This is God, let me meditate on your word day and night. Oh, let me be reminded, Lord God, of how blessed I am. For I am confident in the Lord. I am secure in the Lord. 
the Lord. I have no wants in the Lord. But you've got to let your worship be a reflection of your relationship with God. See, if God has done some great things for you, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. If you are a survivor, then you understand that God is your provider. See, if you are a survivor, you understand that God is your provider. And I'm going to do you like Oprah does it. Is that all right? She says, you got a new car. You got a new car. You got a new car. But I want you to know that you are a survivor. 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 And God is the rock in your slingshot. You are mighty in battle. You are. You are valor in times of war. You are. You are able to slay your Goliath. You are able to hold your temper. You are able. And you will not want for any good thing. I want you to know you can overcome your biggest fear. That's that false evidence appearing real. Your biggest problem, your biggest trial, your biggest storm. Why? Because you worship a bigger God. God, all you have to do is put the rock in the slingshot. All you have to do, preacher, is aim, focus, and fire. And I want you to know that God will take that slap him right in the middle of the head of your Goliath and bring him down with one shot. And you don't have to worry about a thing because the Lord God is, he is, he is your shepherd. You know you've heard some hurts, right? Heartbreaks. But Yahweh is in the business of restoration. I want you to know that I've had to go through some things because I'm mommy's baby and daddy's baby. I want you to understand that I had to suffer that. I could have easily been an aborted child, but God saw so fit for me to survive. And when I look at the 50 years of survival that I've had, I find myself right now standing in the pulpit of Union Grove Baptist Church proclaiming and participating the gospel of Jesus Christ. I serve a God. I serve a God. I serve a good God. Oh, I serve a God. seven minutes or so. I want to talk briefly from this simple subject and we honor the Lord's presence, amen, for the theme which is I'm a survivor, amen, but I briefly want to talk about my subject for today is look at me now. Right, Won't you just look at somebody that came out tonight to have a little bit of church and say neighbor, neighbor. after all the hell I've been through, all the hell I've been through. Look, at me now. look at me now. Let us pray. Father, I need you 
and I need you now. In Jesus' name I pray. Somebody shout amen. 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 We've come to understand today, church, that we're living in a prophetic season. And oftentimes, in a prophetic season, in this generation in which we live, folk like to categorize it as a big house, expensive cars, a, a foreign pocketbook, amen, or a good pair of Christian Louboutin shoes. But won't you just look at somebody and say, neighbor, in this season, God's about to do something that he's never done before. I know this and I'm quite confident, amen, tonight, church, because the Bible says, uh, amen, that he is going to do a new thing. And the reason why God had said a new thing, because it's something that he's never done before. That's why every time I walk into the house of faith, regardless of what my bank account looks like, regardless of a man of what's going on in my life, I can still lift my hands and open up my mouth. Because in spite of it all, this is still the day that the Lord has made. So regardless if my neighbor wants to give God praise or not, Regardless if anybody on my road wants to praise him, I'm still going to lift up my hands and open up my mouth. Because not only is this the day that the Lord has made, but I've made up in my mind that I will rejoice and be glad in it. And is there anybody in this sanctified church on tonight that says in spite of what's going on in my life, God has been so good to me. In fact, I was listening to a song just recently by the man by a man by the name of Kurt Carr. And he wrote a song by the name of Every Mountain. Amen. And in this song, Kurt Carr said, for every mountain, uh, you've brought me over. And for every trial, you've seen me through. If I can park my Bentley over here for just a moment, is there anybody in this church on tonight where God has brought you through some bad relationships? Where God has brought you through some hard times? I feel like I'm preaching to myself up here. Is there anybody in this church on tonight that says, amen, that I may not have a, a Bentley, I may not live in a, in, a, in a mansion, but in spite of it all, I can still tell the Lord thank you because God has been the God of our weary years and the God of our silent tears. Y'all ain't talking back to me. Come on church. But as we see now here in this text, amen, many theologians and many scholars like to argue the fact that David wrote this text when he was going through trials and when he was going through tribulations. But I know for a fact that in spite of what I'm going through, I can turn amen to Psalm 23 which says the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want Amen. When I'm going through hell and high water, when folk are talking about me, may have scandalized my name, might have stabbed me in the back. Amen. I can turn to Psalms 34, which says, I will bless the Lord at all times, and God's praise shall continually to be in my mouth. Is there anybody in this church on tonight huh, that says, in spite of what I'm going through, in spite of what folk have said about me, and if, amen, there is such a, a time in your life, amen, where people like to bring up everything that you've done in your past, huh, Every time you're doing good and you're doing exactly what God had called you to do, folk like to say, baby, I remember what you did yesterday. I remember how you was before. But when people try to talk about you, the first thing you want to say to them is say, my windshield is bigger than my rear view. In other words, what's ahead of me is bigger than what's behind me. And so as I can get to my three points and I'm going to take my seat now. So in this season, not only do we have to be careful for those of you who are taking notes who we talk to, because everybody, amen, is not going to speak greatness uh, upon our lives. Amen. There are some people uh, that are jealous of where some folks uh, are going. Uh, amen. And not only was we be very careful who we talk to, uh, we've got to be very careful. And I know tomorrow is Memorial Day. Uh, we've got to be careful who we invite over for dinner. Can I talk this thing now? Uh, I told people, I said, if you don't like me, uh, you ain't got to invite me over for Sunday dinner. Uh, I'll go down to Third Avenue. Uh, I'll go to Popeye's and go get me a free piece of a biscuit, and they better not forget the grape jelly. Is there anybody here in this singing about church on tonight? And I feel like talking about Jesus now. Because Jesus is my rock in a weary land. Jesus is my bright and morning star. Jesus is my wheel in the middle of the wheel. Jesus is my alpha and my omega. Amen. Is there anybody in this sanctified church tonight that said, I don't got to hear my favorite preacher. I don't got to hear my favorite worship leader. But all I've got to do is look back all of my life and see where God has brought me from. Because if I can turn, amen, and use God for a moment, look back over my life about three, five, eight, and ten years ago, I would just break out into a shout because God picked me up. He turned me around and he placed my feet on solid ground. And if anybody in this church tonight that knows that you haven't always been saved, but when Jesus came 
to bless you. You've got to understand that God had already put it in you since before you was born on this earth. So not only has he blessed you, but you've got to do what God put in your head. You've got to do it to be what God put in your heart. And you've got to do, amen, what God had called you to do. Amen, because Moses was just a man with a stuttering problem. But there was a deliverer on the inside of him. David was just a man with a lust problem. But there was a king on the inside of him. Jacob was a man who was a liar. But there was a leader on the inside of him. And let me come down your road and talk about somebody that you might know. Michael Jordan was just a boy who was kicked off the JV team because he didn't have game. But there was a six-time NBA champion on the inside. Barack Obama was just a community organizer. But there was a United States president on the inside. Reverend Hart was just an associate minister from Baltimore. But there was a president over Humber. Amen. Frederick Cooper was just an associate minister. But there was a wonderful leader on the inside. And I've come to tell somebody that every time you come to church, you want to have your hands lifted up and your mouth open. Because if it had not been for the Lord who was on your side, none of this would be possible. So as I go to my seat, let me leave you with this one word. And that one word is congratulations. Because you survived the whole seat. That you got this far not because you're cute or handsome, huh? but there was a man named Jesus. Huh? What's his name? Huh? Jesus. Huh? I said, What's his name? Huh? The theme on this afternoon is I am a survivor. Would you turn with me to 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter? And I'll be reading the 8th and the ninth verse. If you have it, say amen. amen. You want me to go on, say go on. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Second Corinthians 4, 8 and 9. We may be troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down but not destroyed. Amen. Amen. May the Lord have a blessing to the reader and the hearers of his holy word. If I could just leave, you, leave with you just a thought. Knocked down, but not knocked out. All right. All right. All right. In the sports of boxing, I love boxing, there are three kinds, there are all kinds of ways that a boxer can be considered technically knocked out. First, if a boxer is knocked down and unable to get up on his feet, he gains his balance and composure before the referee counts to 10, he's considered technically knocked out. Okay. Second, if and if, and when he gets to his feet, he's given a standing eight count. If the referee feels that though the fighter is on his feet but he's in no condition to continue the fight, the referee will stop the fight and the boxer is considered technically knocked out. Then there's the three knockdown rule. When a boxer who's knocked down three times in the same round be declared knocked out. But isn't it good to know that it doesn't matter how many times we get knocked down, just as long as we get back up again? The good thing about this is the fact that when we do get back up, we may not have our full balance and composure, but just the mere effort of us trying to get up grabs God's att immediate attention. Our effects to get up makes God sit up. Our effects in trying to get up excites God because our weaknesses prevent God with the opportunity to show up. The Bible teaches us that in our weakest state that God's strength is made perfect. And because of the fact that God always show up in our weakest moment, every time we get knocked down in life by some tribulation, some opposition, some disappointments, by some heartbreaks, by some trials we go through every day, as long as we get up, the fight is not over. This afternoon, I'm looking at a church full of fighters. Some of you may not know that you're a fighter, but just the simple fact that you're still here and still holding on despite all the hell you're going through tells me that you're a fighter. 
Life would throw some unexpected blows and knock you clean off your feet. Is there anybody in here this afternoon that been hit with something in life that left you totally numb? Yes. Amen. A fighter could train all he can, but in the best and be in the best shape of his life, he still can get hit, knocked down by the unexpected punch. Yes. It doesn't matter how strong you are. Life will hit you with a blow that will literally knock you senseless. But it pays, pays to pray up. And it pays to study and learn the word. Because that is your training. And according to how well a fighter trained, that determines how fast he can cover from a serious knockdown. I don't want you to think that some of us preachers and leaders were never beaten. But we, but we were never ultimately defeated. We may lose a battle, but if, if you know like I know, you're going to win the war. If you are in a bad situation right now, I want you to know that you are going to make it. You're going to win this fight. You may be knocked down, but you're not knocked out. For the Bible says the steps of a man is ordered by the Lord. Though he falls, he's not utterly destroyed. Is there anybody here like that, like me, been knocked down before? Yes, I've been knocked down, but I was able to get up. So not only am I a fighter, but I am a survivor. Are there any survivors in the house tonight? I need you to get excited. And anybody here tonight, this afternoon, a survivor? I like Destiny Child song. It said, I am a survivor. I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to stop. I'm going to work harder. I am a survivor. I'm going to make it. I will survive. I come to tell somebody to keep on surviving. I need you to excuse. I need the, the survivors right now to get excited. Stand up on your feet and get excited. Sometimes you need a testimony to somebody else. They need to see that you survive. Ah, because you know what? We've all been through hell. Yeah, yeah, but we're still here. We still have our right mind. We still have our joy. And most of all, no matter what, we still can get our praise on. Uh, Paul, the author of this sense, was knocked down, but he wasn't knocked out. At one point in his life, he dealt with an issue he had. He had a thorn in his flesh. Listen to what he said in 2 Corinthians 12, 7, and 10. Even though I have received such wonderful revelation from God, so to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to talk me, talk, talk, torment me and keep me from becoming proud. Three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. Each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weaknesses. So now I'm glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in, in the results of hardship, persecution, and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So here in the same Paul, encouraging the Corinthian church. Yeah, and he's encouraging us today. Though we had hard press, passion on every side, troubles and opposition in every way, yet we are not crushed. God knows just how much we can bear. So I need you to stop complaining right now. You might be perplexed, but not in despair. Despair, hopeless, but there is a way out. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Forsaken, but not forgotten about. He would never leave you. No, he would never forsake you. Shut down, but not destroyed. So all these things are happening. We may not understand them. We may feel we just can't handle them. But we have a father who can. He sits high and he looks low. He dies by every footstep, everywhere we go. He's able. I come to tell somebody the Lord God is able to carry you through. Say 
12, and then I'm going to jump to 42 and 12. We're talking about being a survivor. But before you got to survive some stuff, you got to go through some stuff. Yeah. So I'm going to talk about can God trust you with trouble? Can God trust you with trouble? Now in this particular passage of scripture, we start at the first chapter of Job where we saw that Job, where we talked about Job being from the land of us, that Job was an upright man, that he feared God, and he eschewed evil. Let me break that down. That means Job minded his business. He didn't talk about anybody. He wasn't in anybody's business. But he did what was right and pleasing in the sight of God. He did the things that God required of an upright man to do. So the day came where the sons of God came before God and they presented themselves and the question was asked of Satan. Now don't you know when God called his people together, his sons and his daughters, Satan always have a habit of showing up? You minding your business, you running late for church, your stock is going to get a run. Your ponytail ain't gonna come on just right. Your kids is acting crazy. You can't get a cab. That's the devil in the details. Doing his job. Because you're trying to get into the presence of a holy God. And he's doing his job to stop you from getting there. So the sons of God came to present themselves before God. And God said to Satan, Where did you just come from? He said, Listen here. I came from walking to and fro in the earth, seeking whom I may devour. If you watch the news today, you can still see that the devil is still walking to and fro in the earth. Our children can't go to school. Our people can't cross the street. You can be in your house, minding your business, and the car can jump the curb and go through the bottom of your building. You can be walking the street, and a straight bullet might hit you. You never know. What happened? Yeah. Right. Now you're walking the street because Satan yeah. is right. still walking right. to and fro, yes. right. seeking yeah. whom he may devour. Yeah. So this is where it gets interesting because Job didn't ask for this. Right. 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 God volunteered Job right. for trouble. Right.
But one thing, there's three major things we need to learn from Job about being a survivor. Because being a survivor doesn't mean that you're not going to go through things. Being a survivor does not exempt you from trouble. In fact, being a survivor sets you up. It meant that you went through some things, that you cried through some things, that these things that came in your life did not kill you, but you made it through. We have all kinds of survivors that the world recognizes. They recognize breast cancer survivors and all kind of abuse survivors and car accident survivors and all kind of survivors. I survived, they got t-shirts for everything. I survived having a baby. I survived getting a divorce. I survived crossing the street and getting hit by a car. But when do we celebrate the folks that survived their tests and their trials and came out stronger and better? There are many instances in the Bible of folk that were survivors. You want me to talk about them? Yeah, I'm glad you said so. Now, see, Daniel was a survivor. Minding his business, praying to his God, and the folks is looking in his window, minding his business. But what did he do? He did not change his persuasion. He did not change what he confessed. He did not change what he believed when the enemy came to him. What he said was, listen, if you're going to throw me in there, throw me in there. Storm. 
You can expect faith and speak down. I never tell the folk I'm broke. What I say is I'm between blessings. Because God promised to provide my needs. You never speak that you sick and you're going to die. Because the Lord is Jehovah Rapha, for the Lord that is your healer. So you speak healing to your blessings. Your, your outlook in your storm will determine your outcome. Talk about it. Sometimes we stay in stuff longer than we're supposed to stay in it because we talk ourselves there longer than we're supposed to be there. I don't know if I'm going to make it to you. Mm. You just had it for one day on that for what? For what? For what? When you could have been out of this storm when you, if you would have spoke faith to your storm instead of fear. Wow. All right. All right. Amen. I'm going to leave that point right now. You have to make sure you know who's in control. That's right. When your wife came to him, and said, listen, Joe, what you doing that you got us in all of this mess? You better curse God and die. Joe's response to her was, naked I came into this world. And naked I shall return. Shame this and this. And that said, blessed be the name of the Lord. Now see, the problem is Joe didn't run to his friends because his friends was crooked anyway. They was a little crap because they also told Joe, listen, you did something. What you do? You can tell us with your homeboys. We got your back. We will help you out of this situation. And then
I'm wearing him out now. I'll be the enemy of the world. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Every day, whether or not I feel like it, or even if I feel like I'm on the losing side of the battle at this point, my praise, I'm a thermos, I am a thermostat and not a thermometer. My praise changes some stuff. So today, when you are surviving, make sure you keep a positive outlook. Amen. Make sure you know who's in control. Yeah. And when you come out, survivor, make sure you give God a survivor's praise. But don't develop survivor's remorse. Because God brought you out. And some people were left where they are. You want to know why? Because your outcome is contingent on your praise and your confession. And your relationship yes. and their outcome is contingent upon their praise, their confession, right. and their outlook. Yes. Right. 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 Positive confession, positive outcome. Shaky confession, shaky outcome. Negative confession, negative outcome. My friend and my brother, that of the elder Adrian and Sean Reed. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's give God praise tonight. The name of the Lord is indeed worthy to be praised. Come on, let's praise God tonight. Lord, the mighty God we serve. Angels bound before him, heaven and earth do adore him. What a mighty God we do serve. To God our Father, to Jesus who is our elder brother, to the Holy Spirit, our comforter and our keeper. To the angel and set man of this house and the person of Reverend Frederick Crawford. Let's give God praise for him. Amen. Amen. To my brother and friend, Reverend Earl Taylor, to these preachers who have blessed us, and to any pastors and preachers who are here as well. We praise God for this privilege and opportunity to be here uh, to share God's word with you. I want to go straight to the word of God. I do not want to hold you long. Just want to get in and get out of your way. Mark chapter number four. What I want to lift in your hearing, verses 35 through 41. Mark chapter 4, verses 35 through 41. Reads us then the same day when the even was come, he saith unto them, Let us cross over unto the other side. Right, right, right. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. There arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, sleep on a pillow. They awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind, and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? They feared exceedingly and said one to another, What manner of man is this? And even the wind and the sea obey him. Father, this is your word. These are your people. I'm simply your servant. I pray that you would do only as you please in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank God. I want to talk simply from this subject, storm survivors. Storm survivors. Dear friends, I must tell you at the outset of this message that lessons always precede test days. Yeah. Dear friends, you need to understand that right before Jesus allows these disciples to go through this storm, they had a lesson based on faith. Mm -hmm. Because in the pericope that precedes this one, you have the parable of the mustard seed. Yeah. Brothers and sisters, all of us need to have faith in the midst of the storm. We need to know that we can believe in and trust in God even in the toughest times of our lives. And no matter what we're going through, we've got to be able to maintain our faith in the Lord. But please let me tell you at the outset that storms in life are one of three things. Storms in life, dear friends, are first of all inevitable. In other words, dear friends, you cannot avoid the storms that will come in your life. 
They will happen. You have to go through them. In other words, as Matthew 5 and 45 would suggest, uh, that God sends his rain on the just as well as the unjust. Does not matter if you're saved or unsaved, you will experience some storms in your life. But not only are storms in life inevitable, but storms in life are also unpredictable. You and I will never know when storms are going to come our way. And things can be going well in our lives and all of a sudden a storm can come out of nowhere because storms in life are unpredictable. But also, dear friends, storms in life are impartial. It does not matter who you are tonight, you will have to face some storms. I don't care if you're Deacon Dan, Elder Eddie, Sunday School Sally, or even Missionary Martha, you will have to experience some storms in this life. But this little pericope that I've lifted for you today encourages you and I that God can be trusted in the storms of our lives. And is there anybody that can praise God early in the message? I know you're tired. I'm tired as well. It's been a long day, but I'm not too tired to remind my own self that no matter what comes my way, God can be trusted in the storms of my life. And so, dear friends, Jesus in this text allows you and I to see that sometimes storms will come as a consequence of the lessons that God is trying to teach us. And so after giving these series of parables that Jesus gives, he says, boys, we're crossing over to the other side. Now brothers and sisters what blows my mind about that is simply this, that if Jesus said it, don't you think they were going to make it? In other words, brothers and sisters, if Jesus says we're crossing over to the other side, that inevitably means that we're going to make it to the other side. And the brothers got upright. They got afraid because when they get out there on the sea, as Jesus told them, a storm breaks out. But you read the text. This is not Matthew chapter number 14 or even Mark chapter number 6. This is not where Jesus comes walking to them on the water. Or no, this is where Jesus is in the hinder part of the ship asleep on a pillow. In other words, y'all, Jesus was already there in the midst of their storm. They didn't have to go looking for Jesus, but Jesus was already there. And you ought to be encouraged tonight to know that no matter what you face and no matter what you go through, Jesus is already in the midst of your storm. So that's why when you go through, you ought to go through with your head held high knowing that he's already in the midst of your storm. Is there anybody that can praise God that Jesus is already in the middle of your storm? And so he was already on the boat. He's already on the ship. But watch this, y'all. After a long day of ministering, preaching, teaching, Jesus in his humanity got tired. So Jesus needed to refresh himself. Jesus needed to restore himself. And so he says, boys, I'm going back here and I'm going to sleep. And, and, and that encourages me because Jesus, y'all, even though he was 100% God, uh, he was rather 100% man, he was still 100% God. That means that Jesus did not lay down his omniscience, meaning that he still knew everything. And brothers and sisters, he knew that though he was telling them to cross over to the other side, that they were going to sail into the midst of a storm. But still, Jesus says, even though I'm telling y'all to cross over to the other side, I'm going to go back here and I'm going to sleep. Why? Because Jesus was trying to teach a lesson about faith over and above facts and fears. And you got to get to a place where you still have faith no matter what the facts and your fear may say. And so brothers and sisters, all of a sudden a storm breaks out. Some scholars y'all suggest that this was between a hurricane and an earthquake. They suggest that this was a major, major storm. Could you imagine being in the midst of a hurricane and an earthquake at the same time? I understand why the boys got afraid, got upright, but Jesus has to remind them that no matter what's going on around you, all you got to do is praise the God who's above you. That no matter what you may face, you still ought to be able to glory in God because God is able to turn things around. So they got upright, they got afraid, and in 1611 Shakespearean language, they say, Master, carest thou not that we perish? 
2016 version? Hey! That's for those of y'all that was falling asleep. The storm is raging. And we about to die. And you back there sleeping. We need you to get up, do something about this situation, and then we can sail on over to the other side. And y'all know what Jesus does next? Jesus gets up. He rebukes the winds. He rebukes the waves. And he rebukes the disciples by saying, Oh ye of little faith, why did you even doubt my brothers and my sisters? Can I tell you? He rebukes the winds and he rebukes the waves uh, because what he was suggesting is I'm Lord over creation. He was suggesting that no matter how topsy-turvy life becomes, I'm Lord over everything that's going on around you. He says, my brothers and my sisters, peace. Be still. In other words, the storm got done, y'all. The storm couldn't even talk no more because wherever God speaks, things have to change. And is there anybody that can praise God that things have to change whenever God opens his mouth to speak? So, just be, be still or quiet, be still. The storm, y'all, ceases. Jesus was trying to encourage them. First of all, you don't have to doubt when I'm already on your boat. So not only did he rebuke the winds and the waves, but he rebuked the disciples by saying, O oh, ye of little faith. Nowhere in scripture you ever find God having a problem with people that have too much faith. First of all, y'all, that's an impossibility. You cannot have too much faith. The problem in scripture was always a lack of faith. The problem with everybody in scripture was the fact that they just didn't believe God enough. They didn't have enough faith to believe that God, number one, was who he said he was, and number two, could do what he said he could do. And so he rebukes the disciples by saying, oh ye of little faith, why did you doubt when you had me on your boat? It ain't like I was walking to you on the sea. I'm already on your boat. Can I encourage y'all? As I get ready to leave tonight, it's 521. I know you've been here long enough, so it's time to go. But let me encourage you. If Jesus is already on your boat, then you have absolutely, positively nothing at all to worry about. Can I tell you tonight that Jesus was really teaching a lesson about faith again over and above facts and fears because the storm said watch this y'all of the fear said the storm is raging yeah that's the facts y'all the fear said we're about to die but the faith said as long as Jesus is on my boat I don't have anything at all to worry about. And is there anybody here tonight that knows that you don't have anything to worry about if Jesus is already on your boat? And I'm glad tonight to tell you that since he's already on your boat, you can give him praise in advance because he's got everything under control but one last thing that I tell you and then I take my seat I need to tell you tonight that Jesus was teaching a lesson because watch this y'all he was teaching through sleeping because what Jesus wanted them to understand is that no matter what's going on in your life you ought to be able to sleep in the midst of the storm and is there anybody here that I don't care what you're going through when you get home tonight you're going to put your head on the pillow and you're going to go to sleep because if Jesus stays up never slumbers and never sleeps then why in the world are you up at night you ought to put it in God's hands and watch God work it out won't it work it out lean over and tell somebody he will work it out he will work it out won't he do it won't he do it Yes, he will. Yes, he will. Say yeah. If you know he will. Say yeah. If you know he will.
I'm done. It's my turn. If Jesus is always up, and if Jesus is in control, then watch this. No more should you be up at night pacing the floor, worrying about what you can't control no way. Here's what you ought to do if you're going to be a storm survivor. Say, God, this ain't even my problem no more. It's your problem now. I'm going back in and I'm going to sleep. You do something about this and I guarantee you he'll work it out on your behalf. But when he works it out, here's what you ought to do. Psalm 107 verse 2 says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. But I like the NIV version because it says, let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story. And if you got a story, you ought to tell it. And God will. Magnificent job. Yes. Let's give him another hand. Amen. We thank and praise God for all the associate ministers who are here tonight and all those from other auxiliaries. I just want to share a few uh, announcements with you. Amen. Uh, on June 10th, we'll have more uh, um, uh, preachers uh, at the Memorial Baptist Church on Friday, June the 10th. Amen, amen. Uh, 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 Reverend uh, Frederick Miller is among them. Uh, Reverend Dr. Russell will be our worship leader. We want you to join us there. And then I'm going to have, amen, uh, uh, Reverend Taylor join us uh, on June the 12th. On June the 28th, there's going to be a special uh, uh, fellowship service along with Easter, amen, at the Macedonia Baptist Church in Mount Vernon. Um, uh, the United Missionary Baptist Fellowship and, uh, and Eastman were joined together on Tuesday, June the 28th. So we invite you all to join us uh, there. Amen. Amen. In July, we have our third quarter session at the Friendship Baptist Church in Harlem. The associates will meet on Wednesday, July 27th. And then on July 31st, amen, we will have our next fifth Sunday service at the Little Mount Bethel. Amen, Baptist Church. We do, do invite you to join. And then in October, in October, we will be celebrating the 10th pastoral anniversary. Yes. Amen. Yes. Amen. Of Reverend yes. Dr. Frederick Cross. Yes. Amen. Yes. Amen. Yes. Amen. Yes. So we thank and praise God and we will be there to support you. I thank you. I thank you for your support. I thank you for your brotherhood. I thank you for your encouragement. Amen. God bless you. Have a smile upon you. Pastor Crawford. Let's stand yes. and Amen. praise the Lord for him. Amen. Let the people of God say amen. amen. Let the people of God say amen again. Amen. amen. You may be seated for about two minutes. I just want to give honor to God and to the president. Let's give it up for the president. Amen. President Hawking is here. He is doing an outstanding job. Amen. And I'm very pleased at what he's doing with our associate ministers amen. and our associated churches. Yes. To Mother Crawford, who's here, I'm grateful for my mother amen. being here today. To our worship leader, Reverend Taylor, amen, did a great job putting us together today. All these fine preachers, amen, let's give it up for these preachers today. Amen, I saw Pastor Wendy earlier, I don't know if she left, but I saw her early. Okay, and all the other pastors, ministers, Reverend Russell, my friend and brother, and all the other ministers that are here, we were certainly blessed by this uh, service today. Amen, what a blessing. What a blessing yes. from the Lord. You know, when I hear preaching like that and, and, it, and it touches my heart, I know that the future of the church is in good hands. Amen. Amen. The future of the church is in good hands. And that's why we promote these type of things. We want to encourage these type of things because we want to make sure that the church survives even after we are off the scene. And so I am very excited, amen, about these preachers who talked about being able to survive the storm. And uh, Minister Baca talked about the Lord is my shepherd. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. You can survive the storm when he's your shepherd. Yeah. Amen. And then Minister Washington talked about look at me now. Yeah. When you've been through something, you ought to tell people, look at me now. Yeah. Amen. And we thank God for my sister, Evangelist Crawford. Woo. Amen. Talk about being knocked down, but not knocked down. Yeah. Amen. And then my daughter in ministry, Minister Holden. Amen. But God bless her. She blessed our hearts 
here tonight with a wonderful word about Job, amen, and told the story about Job. And then uh, Reverend Reed, God bless him, talked about being able to survive the storm. And my brothers and sisters, these ministers dealt with the issue, dealt with the subject, and blessed our hearts here tonight. And I'm glad I stayed. I don't know about you, but I'm glad. I've been here since 8 o'clock. I'm glad I stayed to hear these preachers are uh, preached out of their hearts today.